Okay. So what is an ethical act for review? Well, it is an act which increases creativity and I'll put in parentheses here for any of its logical equivalents for at least one person, including the person acting, and diminishes it for none. What are some equivalents of creativity? Logical equivalents. You name one, awareness. Access to objective truth is another. Love is a logical equivalent of creativity in that sense. That if any one of these things increases, they all increase. If any of them is limited or diminished, they're all limited or diminished. And the list goes on. Awareness, objective truth, creativity, love. Those are the, the words I use as my central identifiers of those things. But there's probably a lot more. I just identify with those four. Okay. So an ethical act increases one or more of these resources, creativity, love, etc., for at least one person and limits or diminishes for none. No way. I cannot sacrifice one person for the good of the many and be doing something ethical. This definition results in a whole list of principles. And part of the training you get when you do the workshop is you'll understand all those principles. Logical consequences of this definition. Just turn the crank of logic and how come all these principles. For example, you cannot achieve an ethical outcome by unethical means. Pure logic from this definition. And, along with that, every ethical means is an ethical end in itself. Those two conclusions come right out of this definition. Well, can you explain that every ethical means is an ethical end of itself? Mm. I've heard uh, you say it before, and I, I I want to wrap my head around it so I know what. Okay. I, I feel I understand that statement as well. Okay. As I Let's see if I can erase this. use this symbol to represent a goal, an ethical goal, something worth doing that is ethical. And over here we've got a person or people intending on reaching that goal. How? Whatever the how is, whether it's a process, a procedure, the use of a tool. We'll call that the means. It's the means to achieve this end. This is an ethical end. In achieving this end, we're increasing creativity without limiting it or diminishing it for anyone. Okay? Well, If the means limits or diminishes creativity for someone, anyone, then this process results in a limiting of somebody's creativity, does it not? On the way to getting from here to there, if the means is not ethical, you will have reduced somebody's creativity. What if 
The means is not ethical, but it's not unethical either. It's neutral. Well, how do you know whether an act... See, this is itself an act. Is, it, is ethical a ternary function? Ternary? Is it not, is it not just true or false? There's a, ne there's a neutral? Yeah. Something that doesn't increase creativity and doesn't diminish creativity is neutral. A zero point on the scale. I'm glad you brought that up. I've always just thought of ethical as ethical or not ethical, not in. Not neutral. N yeah. An act can be that. neutral. <laughs> An act can be neither one nor the other. Think of it as a scale, okay? Think of creativity as the product of ethical awareness and, into, and intelligence. I've, algebraically, I've written that as a scalar product, but it's actually not. It's more complicated than that. It's more like a vector product. <laughs> or a, a, Never mind, we don't have to go into the higher math of this thing. Come back to here, okay? Here you are, moving towards a goal, and at the end, you have creativity enhanced and zero destruction of, cre of creativity. That's the outcome. No destruction of creativity is one of the conditions that makes it an ethical outcome. Well, this whole thing is an action. And if the means is unethical, then you're going to get some kind of destruction of somebody's creativity. It's one of the results. So when you get to the end of the process and you look at the results, part of what you get over there is this. Therefore, the means has to be ethical in itself. Let me use an example uh, just to um, put this maybe um, not exists. Okay, so let's just use the stable currency scenario, okay. right? Well, if we stabilize currency for all of us, then we're decreasing the creativity of the people who are printing the money. Oh. <laughs> Right. I've got to show you another little piece of this. So This is why it takes training. Okay, This is why I give workshops. Because you're asking questions that are like, after the first three hours of the workshop, people are like apt to ask this kind of question. Okay, Because you haven't been introduced to enough of the concepts. That's why I'm calling what I'm doing now training and not just presenting. Okay. I, don't, I didn't mean to hijack your training. That's okay. I just love it. I love it when people ask intelligent questions because it gives me an opportunity that I wouldn't have otherwise. Let's say this axis represents creativity. And somewhere on it is a zero point. And let's say, in evaluating any particular action, that we'll just scale this to minus one and plus one. You can do minus infinity and plus infinity, but it's harder to wrap your mind around. So an action that is totally destructive would be at a minus one. It does no good for anyone, nobody benefits, and everybody is hurt. And over here is the opposite. Here's, here is the place where that action is if everybody benefits and nobody is hurt. Okay. Creativity is on a scale. Now, what about these bankers that are stealing your buying power? Well, their actions are over here somewhere. And if you stop them doing what they're doing, guess what? You move them over here. Same principle applies to self-defense. If someone's about to kill you, Destructive. You shoot, bang. 
They drop dead. And some people say, oh, they just destroyed their creativity. No. They're over here. I've moved them to zero. I increased their creativity. When you stop someone from being destructive, you increase their creativity. Is that contextualizing for you? Yeah. How about that? I mean, I think I, I already knew that it was still the right thing to do, but that's helpful. Illustration, definitely. Yeah. I needed to look at that several times before I understood it. Changed my outlook about a lot of things. And as you continue to be exposed to these well, this ideas... Well, this is another, you know, this is why disciplining a child or, uh, you know, making somebody serve a sentence for a crime that they've committed is actually increasing creativity by this illustration. Yes, in, in more ways than one. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You know, I used to be against the death penalty. And I, in studying penalties, because you brought it up, penal system. In studying penalties, what I realized is that for a really heinous crime, with a person who's a psychopath, who you can never change a psychopath, we have no idea how to do that. You know, with all the years of psychology, psychiatry, therapy, etc., that we have, we, have, we know a lot. Okay, but no one has yet found a way to change a psychopath into a non-psychopath. Well, what do you do with those folks? The most ethical outcome would be, I'm looking for the word, uh, what did they do to Napoleon? They, oh, exile, that's the word. Exile would be the most ethical response to such a person. <clears throat> well, in today's world, where are you going to exile someone? Well, you might say you could put them in jail for life without, without parole, but then you're forcing people to pay for that guy's existence. And that's not ethical. So what do you do? Until we have a feasible way to exile people or to change psychopathic outlook to a non-psychopathic, the death penalty is the only answer. I had to think long and hard to arrive at that. I don't expect you to agree right away. Well, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. So, I mean, we have in this country uh, laws that vary from state to state. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have prostitution in mm -hmm. Las Vegas, and you can have, well, it used to be gambling there, but now gambling is being more pervasive. Um, yeah, now that, now that the governments have decided that it's their business. You know, <laughs> I mean, if, if you had a, uh, I mean, it doesn't sound like places like Detroit are doing so well, so let them... Right. All go to Detroit, and or, I mean, I'm using that just as a. I mean, they're a terrible scapegoat, but I mean, you know, just send them somewhere to designate an area. I mean, there's so uh -huh. much federal land, right? That's un all right. that's unallocated. All right. If we could take the map and on it we could find some place that is not being used, and if we decided jointly voluntarily to create the kind of cash flow necessary to contain people in that area so they absolutely cannot get out. Then when you run across a psychopath, you give them a backpack with a knife and some matches and so forth and you stick them in there and forget it. Along with all the other psychopaths that are in there. Hey, you're with you your kind. Huh? You about yeah, escape from uh, <laughs> New York or LA. <laughs> right. I might just have to pop taking notes here. Escape from where? <laughs> escape from New York. Yeah, there were two oh, it's classic. You haven't seen it? Uh, you're talking to somebody who uh, is very careful to avoid uh, cultural influence most of the time. Uh, 